Welcome back, Tactical Mother Flowers, to another Gutter Fighting Secrets Tactical Podcast. Today, we're going to be joined by a gentleman named Stacy Holland. And Stacy, is it Stacy you, you on Holland? Call me Ewan. Ewan. Stacy Ewan. Ewan Holland. We're joined by Ewan today, and he is an ex British military warrior back in the days of Northern Ireland. Now, this is something that fascinates me quite dearly. It really, I've always had a fascination with the conflict between the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland. I actually, um, as some of you guys know, did my surveillance training in the north of England and was trained by some of these same guys that probably Yuan knows personally, um, I would just guess. So, Yuan, thanks for coming on, bro. I know we were talking in the comments and you mentioned that you had served in Northern Ireland um, and we were going back and forth. Um, you mentioned that you were in one of the Friends regiments. I know a lot of guys and girls out there aren't going to know kind of about the British military. So I'm going to let you kind of take it away. Can you give us a little bit about your history, how you got into the British military, um, what units you were, may or may not have been involved with, and then um, take it from there a little bit. Uh, mother and father, both military. Uh, I was conceived in Northern Ireland <laughs> in war. <laughs> yeah. In the butts, in the rifle butts where they zero their weapons. My mother got kicked out of the military. She was there serving under a colonel from the, my regiment, the Argyles and Sutherland Highlanders. And that is why I joined the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders, which are based, their, their castle is Stirling Castle, is their headquarters, the regimental headquarters, which is not where like, they get posted everywhere, but that's our castle. That's pretty cool, man. So you guys actually have like a castle that you're that yes. you're out of. Stirling Castle. Huh. That's cool. You can you can still go to Stirling Castle and see like what the Argyles were, because we're disbanded now. We don't exist. They disbanded the Scottish division, the seven Scottish regiments, and they turned it into like the Highland Division. And my regiment was basically turned into a company of specialists. Yeah. And yeah. within the Highland Regiment. And now they're just gone. Now, Canada still has our gales. Huh. Huh. Canada and the UK are uh, kind of a, a unique thing. I mean, you guys are technically, they're not a commonwealth of you anymore, right? But at one point, I think they were. They still have the Queen. Okay. And the Queen's on the money. Right. Yeah, that's right. She is. I never really understood that, like why the Queen was on the money, but I guess... God saved the Queen and all that. <laughs> <laughs> so, by the way, I want to put this out there for people. Um, Yuan, you were saying your middle name, Stacey Yuan Holland. Um, your middle name actually Ewan. means something... Yuan actually means something pretty freaking badass man it means like nordic warrior or something it's, it's gallic and, uh, and it means brave young warrior and a brave warrior i checked it out in the the the, the celtic book of names a long time ago the, the, but you know i'm not even celtic i'm and what they call norn i'm from the orkney islands uh -huh. we're like we've got our pictish blood in us yes but the, the Danes took over, and we were belonged to Denmark until a few hundred years ago. Okay. And we were what they know they knew as the Black Norns, the, the mercenary force years ago, which got turned into the Lovett Scouts, who were a sniper regiment in the First World War and that. Yeah. Like that's hundreds of years' history, like that you can connect the dots all the way through from like Viking days yeah. when we were Vikings to when we became a wedding present to Scotland huh. and then in Scotland right up through the Union as we stand now. You and you were saying that you did a lot of really interesting things over in Northern Ireland. Was that your first deployment? Yeah. Yeah. My first deployment is the one I'll talk about here, I suppose. Yeah, that was that was the most exciting because that was a long while ago when things were still hot. Yeah. Everything after that, well, 
we had one incident and one tour after that, but the rest of it, we had our Glen Garys on. That first tour was Helmets, second, all the other tour, the rest of the tours was all Glen Garys. Or Tam O'Shanters, depended what they told us to put on, yeah? But we, we did get hit on the second tour and the Helmets went back on. They killed a civilian dog handler and a dog. Our dog, Oscar, yeah, a little spaniel, sniffer dog, and Ricky, the civilian dog handler, they threw uh, an IED, uh, blast bomb, coffee jar, we used to call them, coffee jars, into the RUC station, and he was putting the dogs away. We were all going back into the station and that. Boom, off it went. Ricky's legs. I wasn't his real name, and that's a sin. He looked like a comedian called Ricky Fulton, who was very famous in Scotland at New Year's, Hogmanay, he'd be on the television. And this civilian dog handler looked like him. That's why we called him that. And, I, and to this day, I can't remember his name. I remember the dog's name, which is weird. Uh, that was, yeah, that was that tour. But we'll go back to the first one. I went out to Belfast weeks after all my friends because I had to wait until I turned eight because all these 17 year old boys were coming back home in coffins mm. and mothers were like enough's enough and they changed the law that you can go to war at 17 but you have to go to 18 to go to Ireland uh, at the uh, Gulf War yeah that got equalized around the Gulf War 18 across the board I think now my first patrol when I went out I got the crack I was taken a piece of equipment from a friend's back, ECM gear, can't talk about that. He bent down, I was taking that off his back and crack. The bullet went right over us. Everybody piled off to where we had to go, yeah. And after we reacted, as we should to a contact, this is my first patrol, I was out at Fort White Rock. 300 yards, it's like a windy path down. You take a road into White Rock from Fort White Rock. And then from up at the falls end, they try to shoot us. It would be a kilometer, maybe a three-quarters of a kilometer shot. Yeah. Uh, after all died down and that, they brought in a pig. It's a vehicle, yeah. You now, there was one guy called Jockey, shamed us, shamed us all. He ended up upside down in a fence uh, in a hedge. Pissed himself, crying. He got forced into the back of this pig vehicle because I was a new, young. One of the guys, I, I seen the platoon sergeant talk to the corporal and the corporal talked to one of the senior privates. They dragged me over and they got me to look in the back of this pig. And, and I'm like, you all right, jockey? So he's sitting there crying and, but, 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 and he's, no, I'm no all right. I'm no all right, Stacey. And then they dragged me away. Obviously, they were showing me what not to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I was laughing all the way. I, it was great. I was 18. I was getting shot at. This was yeah. brilliant. I was still full of beans, you know, crazy. Uh, it hadn't become a problem yet, you know. When you, when you first go out there, you're all full of all that until it really hits you. Then when the fatigue hits it, hits it hits in, that's when you start disliking the job and yeah. all that, yeah. But, yeah, I was all happy about that. That was uh, that was my first day. That was my introduction. Yeah, sniped at, like, yeah, like 15 minutes out the door. Not even that, yeah. And for, for, as soon as we left there, I got set up by my friends to search a woman's bag who her husband was the Belfast Brigade Commander. Now, of the IRA. Now, the, the guys knew that she would, like, kick off. They knew who she was, and they knew the situation they were putting me in. Oh, the, oh, the scunners, I cussed them. Yeah? This woman went bad shit crazy. Bad shit crazy. You don't believe how crazy she went, yeah? So, and then, like, platoon sergeants run over, platoon commander, they're like, what are you doing? What have you done? All this. And I said, I'm just looking in her bag. We can't put hands on, we have female searchers for that, yeah? And they're like, leave her alone and that, and she's went to her house, and, and I knew the address, because before you go out there, you get to know every face, 
every number plate, every car, where they hang around, where they drink. You're, the intel you get before you go is smashed into your head, yeah? As soon as I seen what address of what house she went into, like, I say, that's the boss's house, yeah? So that was them, like the boy set me up to get a blistering from this woman. Now, uh, the next time they set me up, like, the next day we're out on patrol about further down the road into White Rock, no, past White Rock, getting down into Anderson Town. And they say, like, stop that car there. You know, getting me familiar with the job. So it's this red Escort, Ford Escort. It's like a state one, yeah? And there's, like, two guys in the car. Now, we have no go, people. There's people in the IRA or in Sinn Féin that you're not allowed to stop. Mm. No go. Comes down from on high, don't stop them. That's it, yeah? They, they force that into you. But I stop this car anyway, and I get the man's driving license, and I'm like, something familiar about that name, right? I'm Mr. McLean. He was a certain person's driver, and I look in the back, and I see this man. I did not recognize him for the world. But you put a beard on that face and you would recognize him. It was Jerry Adams. So, platoon commander, platoon sergeant, they're coming over again. What are you doing? That was the boys once again set me up, you know. Eh? <laughs> I'm just stopping the car. Yeah, because there was a no-go area in that, right? But they kind of used that, I think. Maybe that was them using me to get past the no-go thing, maybe. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I, I, you know, but he but did you, have his why, beard shaved. Why? He, why would you not be able to stop certain individuals in the IRA? And ongoing investigations. Okay, you didn't want to up an investigation. Yeah, if 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 like. Sometimes we get called out to do what do something called 16th Int. That's the 16th intelligence cell, yeah, over there. And they'll take jocks, you know, enlisted men, and they'll get them to run going around in civic cars and follow people and do the what because they get to know who the police are, don't they? Obviously, yeah. Uh, but the soldiers' faces are always changing, always changing, yeah. So they don't get to know us, yeah? But they get to know all the cops. Their surveillance is good as well, the IRA. They're very good at what they do. Yeah. They've, they've, they've been, yeah, they've been a, a, a sting in Britain's ass for a long time, you know? They're, they're very devoted. They're, they're, you know, you've got to, whether you agree with them politically or religiously, whatever, you've got to respect the commitment, yeah? They, they were fully committed for that, Yeah. So, and then there's like people like Jerry Adams, because he was political, you, you get soldiers wanting to stop people just because they are who they are, you know? Now, for the uh, guys and girls I, I, watching this right now, Jerry Adams, I'm pretty sure, was a very high-ranking individual in the IRA, correct? No, Sinn Féin. He was the political leader. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. It was Martin McGuinness was... Like the IRA man that went from an active soldier to being a politician. Mm. And he joined Sinn Féin and he became the leader. And he, he Martin McGuinness uh, died recently, yeah. well, some couple of years ago, yeah. But he, he, he left the gun and picked up the pen. People would, that was a bone of contention in this country because he was a so called terrorist, yeah. Uh, okay, by the legal definition, yes, terrorist. But, and I am, I am no fucking sympathizer, right? But I have an understanding for the cause. I really do. Yeah. I know the history, and, and I think they have, maybe they have just cause, maybe they do, because... We, I mean, you go back to the early 70s when the British Army went back out there. We went out there to protect the Catholic population from the Protestant population because they were getting shot on by the Protestants, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, and it turned around, come bloody Sunday, I mean, we'd been at it with the IRA since 
the, the uprisings in, you know, 1916, yeah, all of that stuff. And even before that, 1913, Porrick Pierce, all of that going through, you know, till, till the present day, I mean, they're killing journalists and things now, yeah. You don't see it on the news, but it's happening. They've killed some prison officers, some policemen. It's few and far between, but it's happening. But this is but our the IRA is still very much active. No, no. The this is the what they call the real IRA. This is the new the new break the new generation. Okay. Not the provisional IRA, the Pyra, uh, the IRA, the Inla uh, Irish National Liberation Army. They're calling themselves the real IRA. Hmm. Uh, and they're younger guys. They're not. They don't have the weapons that and the experience that the old, the provisional IRA had. But and they don't have a lot of members. But they have some very, very hardcore members that are will do anything. Hmm. You know? And I, I would assume that Britain has their number and has their faces and their names. And I mean, why not just send in some SS yes. guys? No, that only that only happens when they kill one of us. Uh, it's tap okay. for tap. We used to do tap for tap punishment. You kill a soldier. What do you expect? You know that's dog eat dog. You know you can't go around killing soldiers and then try and want to take us to court. Thirty or forty years down the line for killing one of them. Now they were paid soldiers by the provisional IRA. They took a wage. As soldiers, yeah, and they also used to collect the benefits, the welfare checks, yeah, <laughs> right now. And they used to say, in prison, we're not wearing a prison uniform because we're soldiers, we will wear civilian uniforms, we don't oh. recognize. So they, they say, well, we're soldiers. So now, how can they start taking us to court now, all these years later, because we may have taken out a few of them? Well, yeah, that? That's, that's, yeah. that's grand hypocrisy. Right. Grand hypocrisy. I, 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 my guns are done. I'm finished. The war's over for me. Peace agreement. I'm, I'm really happy for that. But is, is it going to be in vain now because of bloody Brexit? Is, is that going to kick it off again now? I'm that's here what I was whispers. wondering as well. I'm here yeah, no, no, exactly. And I was wondering that too. Like, now that Britain's left the EU, does do old wounds start to kind of unwind now? Yeah, we're having border problems now. Doesn't surprise yeah. me one they, bit. They, 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 they can't keep they can't keep to the, the, the Good Friday agreement mm -hmm. with this European Union exit. Uh, the, 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 the people in the north have the, the, the Republicans have two passports, yeah? And that's part of the, 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 the agreement, you know? And they're going to want to close that border. And those people are going to have to go over customs and all that stuff. But that goes against everything that the peace agreement is, I think. A lot. Not everything, but a lot. You're saying and, and for me, they'll have a, an Irish passport and then what? A British passport? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. They get a choice. Like the Hong Kongese had a choice as well. Right. You know, we, we'll look, Britain, Britain pretty much will look after its own, yeah? Uh, I've kind of noticed that. Uh, but it's getting them to decide who is their own is the problem. <laughs> yeah, like, you're not kidding about that, man. By the way, what do you think about Hong Kong? I mean, the Chinese went in and took it. What are your thoughts as a Briton about that? Well, I hate those commies, you know, I just, <laughs> I, I don't like communism. I hate the group think and I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, you know, I, I don't like any ideology. As we talked about before, I'm, we're biological creatures, not ideological cre yeah. creatures. I despise the right, I despise the left. I would put them all up against the wall because they are all fucking yeah. with our lives. Yeah. Oh, it's and that true. goes for... Yeah, you you say it right on, like so right on, man, is that you when it comes to ideology, it only is gonna fuck with your life. 
like with innocent people's lives, yeah. right? It, it, you could say the yeah. same thing for the Northern Ireland and the UK situation, Britain situation, where, I mean, it was just two ideologies clashing and it was never going to be solved. It's a good thing that the peace agreement happened. We'll see if it holds. I mean, I'm sure it'll hold to some degree, right? But um, how many lives lost on both sides to, to get there? Thousands, thousands, thousands. Uh, I, I, the count was what, like 5,000 British soldiers, I think. I can't remember. Now, I, I remember it being like crazy high, like higher than what we lost in the last two wars. Yeah. You know, and and Ireland was just this, this thing that went on for like solid, like, like a solid 23 year period of, you know, like here, I, I'm in London now, yeah? It's where the work is, yeah. Yeah, yeah like the, for decades, it would be like two, three bombs at every weekend in the pubs, the post offices. London was getting bombed crazy. Ireland was getting bombed crazy, you know, and like whether it be Belfast or Derry, London Derry, uh, it was chaos. Yeah, it was just, just absolute madness. And that was normality for us, absolute normality. And, but now this new generation don't see that. They don't feel it, yeah? Yeah. Apart from the ones that have been out to Iraq, they had a similar, they have the same experience in Iraq as we have in Ireland. We're basically a police force. Yeah. Yeah, well, and you can't make a military into a police force. It's just not no. what's supposed to happen. And no. I feel like whenever you do, a lot of mistakes are bound to happen. Innocent people are bound to get fucked over and killed by the military that is acting like a police. It's just what's going to happen. It, it's terrible. I, I can honestly say I have, I know it's from my boys and my Breck and my platoon. Uh, yeah, especially those guys. I We showed more control than the, uh, the RUC, the Royal Ulster Constabulary ever did. I seen them do so many dog moves when I was out there. Real dog moves. Uh, and, and the control that I seen was shown from the soldiers, not the not the police. And I see that now. And I, and the police have a problem with pride. Yeah. The, and that's pride, pride, pride. It's like nobody can tell them what to do. Everybody has a narrative and they're never wrong, yeah? I learned that as a young man, as a boy, 18-year-old boy out serving out in Belfast, and I see that now here in the city in London. Pride. I see them abusing and compromising themselves every single day. And I've never met a policeman that has not compromised herself. If they tell me they haven't, they're a liar. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to trust the police. That's just plain and simple, no matter who you are. And that's just good advice, no matter what you're doing. And it's not like I hate cops or anything. I have a lot, I work with them, you know, as you all know, I'm a fireman, okay. but uh, I would never trust, I would never trust one. <laughs> you see, I mean, the, I've seen it in the army, close ranks. When something goes wrong, you close ranks, you look after each other. Yeah. But the problem is they're in the business of law and protecting and serving and pride and hypocrisy. Is, there's, there's, there's no place for that. I, I, I can't see it in that, you know? And you're so right about the army being a lot more controlled. I mean, because you guys have to be, number one, you're professional. You're more professional than a police is in a yes. weird way. I mean, you're, you're more well-trained, you're more disciplined and all of that. Um, uh, even it, interesting our, to me yeah. too about the Ireland situation. Because as you say, like the RUC, they were Irishmen, correct? Yes. If you're north or south, you're an Irishman, yeah. Right. right. So how could they... It just makes me wonder, like, how do you do that to your own people, you know? Well, you'll find a lot of the RUC would have been Protestant. Ah, uh, okay. Freemasons. Wait, where does the oh? Because the Freemasons hate the Catholics, right? Well, I don't know about that. I mean, okay. yes, I think they do hate Catholics. Yeah, the, or at least there was a history of that. Actually, it's the other and, way around. I think the the Catholics don't like the Freemasons. Is that is that what it is? That's, yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah. they're like culty, secret. Right. 
Clack thing, yeah. <laughs> eh, so I mean, the, um, the RU the scheme had different. to be a, a Freemason to get in or something like that? Orange Lodge. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah, think yeah, you have yeah. to be in that, but you they will vet your family to hell, yeah? yeah. They'll see if your family have been in the lodge, and you, it's definitely a prejudiced thing. I mean, back in the day, even still now, I've got some people, some friends here in London that are from Belfast. Some are Protestant, some are Catholic. Some have, have brothers that were in the... IRA, some of my brothers in the UVF. I've got a guy, to, I've got a neighbor whose brother was in the UVF, in fact. Yeah. Uh, UVF, you know, UVF. The, the Ulster Volunteer Force is one of the Protestant ones. Yeah. Right. You get like the UDA, the UVF, the UFF, the Red Hand Commandos. There's, you know, there's on the other side, there's many groups. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're all very vicious. I find the 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 the, that, the loyalist side, who they are, the Protestants, were more vicious than the IRA hmm. because they were backing all the shit up and just being racist and prejudiced against an Irish Catholic. That was that's their thing, yeah. Huh. Now the IRA, well, whilst they might have prejudice about religion and race to the Ulster, you know, because they're Ulster Scots. If you're from Ulster, what you call Ulster Scots or Ulster Vikings, that's the blood. You know, that's the thing. That's the whole argument. It goes back to the Stuart family and even further back to the Vikings, yeah? Mm -hmm. The Fitzgerald, so it goes back. But it's, there's real prejudice going on over there with that stuff, yeah? And now the, 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 the Protestants have always been kept the Catholics down as second-class citizens. Mm -hmm. Like, I would say it's just like the way you guys have it for black folks in America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I never really knew that, to be honest with you. Um, I mean, I knew it was bad between the Protestants and the Catholics, but that's all new to me about how bad it really was. Yeah, yeah. I mean, some of them, they wouldn't even get, like, welfare benefits, yeah? Because all the people working in the benefits office would be Protestant. Jeez. So then you've got some poor Catholic family, working class Catholic family, who by the way might have a hundred children because they don't believe in contraception. And you know how strong the Catholic Church was on Ireland. You know about all the horror stories about the pedo priests. The, the 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 wash houses for the unwed mothers, all of that stuff, yeah. That these unwed mothers had their children stolen from them and treated like slaves and secondhand citizens. I mean, that's the south, but that Catholic mentality goes on in the north too. I mean, it's I mean that I don't like religion either. It's 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 positively medieval, you know. Yeah. So if a family goes up to the benefits office, they've got a lot of kids to feed and they're Catholic and then they've got some prejudiced Protestant woman sitting there angry because her Protestant husband is out there fighting the IRA. She's not going to give this Catholic woman any benefits. You know, that all that stuff went on, you know. They did have a hard time and they did have a lot to fight for. Mm. They really did. Yeah, it's, it's better now. Belfast is looking say that, um, Stacy, because in my experience, any true soldier who has truly experienced kind of that type of clandestine warfare almost is like, they can say, oh, well, maybe the Taliban has a point, you know, like respect them in a way, fuck them, but respect them. And you're saying the same thing is that, well, from your experience over there getting shot at by these guys, but you at the same point, like, you see where they were coming from. Maybe they did have a, a fairly good point, you know? Yeah. And it yeah. really, it says something well, I mean, about the type of warrior that you are. I, I'm a product of my regiment. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that I am. I mean, in the end, me and my regiment did fall out. 
severely. Uh, it was a mess in the end, but you know, I I, I got out, uh, and and it's like it's the best thing that's ever happened to me. You know, I just you can't. Yeah, and it's also the worst. I mean, it's eye opening unless you've been through that concussive lifestyle. Yeah, that's how I like to call it. That's that a constant barrage of abuse. From basic training to doing your job, it, it turns you into a certain person. And if you can't come out of it with some kind of understanding for what the other people are, you shouldn't be there. You shouldn't be there. No, no absolutely not. And if you don't have any s- compassion, so to speak, for the enemy, then you're no you're no better than they are, so to speak, right? So true, true. My my platoon sergeant. Old Joe McCoy, before we went out, before I went out to Ireland that first time, uh, uh, I like we were all excited that we were getting out to Ireland. We were getting ready to go pre Ireland training. Everybody was running around singing Protestant songs, orange songs, hmm. anti IRA songs. Yet there's a lot of guys in the regiment Catholic who were singing IRA songs huh. also. Yeah. Uh, and I remember my platoon sergeant came running into my room, eh? you shut your mouth. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't know the history. You don't know nothing. You don't get to sing those songs now. Yeah. And I was still 17 then, just about to turn 18. And yeah, he had a point, like you just said, you know, it made me think about what he said then. He was a bit of an ass. He didn't need to say it that way. But <laughs> Yeah, but he did have a point, yeah. Uh, but I, I don't think it came from a good place. It just came from a place of arrogance, I believe, mm-hmm. yeah. I got to know that man very well over the years. and He made a lot of mistakes. Yeah, he made a lot of mistakes. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's the thing about being a leader too, though. And I don't know the gentleman at all, but um, you're bound to make a lot of mistakes when you're a leader. It's just... I think yeah. how you deal with those mistakes, can you admit to them? Do you pawn it off on another man? Like, that's how, you know, really, I think what counts. So, yeah, was, sitting in a car, not- and I, I want to get to this, uh, bro, uh, so forgive me, but this is just fascinating to me. Sitting in a car, you've got probably a couple other guys with you, um, some communications going, you know, your, your, what is it, your Browning high power probably in your lap or something like that. Doing some real well, type of work. Talking about the 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 sixteen and the 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 civilian jobs. Uh, that's a brownie nine millimeter under your thigh, your left thigh. Yeah. And your assault rifles are in the back. Uh huh. And you, they they let you grow your hair out and drive around the city, and you know they they give you jobs to do. Obviously, yeah. uh, you're out there a job to do. But when you're young and dumb. You will take opportunities to do stupid things, you know? You'll go to the bloody, go and get a Chinese takeaway, <laughs> running in there like Rambo. Ah, oh, Christ, the stories that are oh, the things that we would do with it. That actually makes me feel a little bit ashamed. <laughs> Cowboys, a little bit cowboy, yeah? But you don't, I don't think you should let immature young men do that also. Yeah, the stories I've heard from you guys about what you guys were doing out there, it's its a wonder more people didn't get killed that way. Yeah, like we were talking about before, there was uh, just before we were told that we were going out and to start our pre-island training, this is a very famous thing, you know, I mean, lots of people know about this. There was two boys from the Royal Signals in a, in a civilian car, and there was an IRA funeral going on. Now, just before that, a man from the UVF had thrown hand grenades into another IRA funeral. So, so they were on their toes. They had a lot of security. Now, these two, uh, these two boys, uh, so two of our boys, they drove to the back of the Milltown Cemetery there, at the back of the shops where it goes up with the fence. And uh, everybody there thought the same thing was going to happen like last time, you know, they were going to get shot at and hand grenades, all that stuff at this IRA funeral. So they didn't wait around for it to happen. They grabbed those two boys 
Now, we had the Army Air Corps up there watching it from the helicopter and videoing it. And they dragged those two boys out of that vehicle, beat them silly, stripped them naked, executed them, and paled them on the fence, and then just kind of threw them over. There's a famous picture, there's a famous photograph of this priest, very famous priest in West Belfast around that area, from Turf Lodge, White Rock, Anderson Town, near the Milltown Cemetery, and that all going around there. Uh, of him leaning over, like, and he takes his jacket off and he puts it over the dead soldier and that, you know, he was naked, Catholic priest and that, and he was trying to get the IRA to stop, don't do this. And But it, it was truly tragic. It was, it truly was, it was a mistake. You know, it, the IRA did admit that they didn't really mean, they meant to do it, but things got taken out of hand, you know, they were because of what happened before recently with the... Uh, uh, some wahoo on the other side, I forget his name. I don't really care to remember his name either. Just keeps them famous, doesn't it? Uh, so, yeah, th that, that was a thing that was very much on my mind when something similar happened to me uh, over there. It was a different part of Ireland, uh, sorry, Belfast. I was over at the other side. I was, it was a different one. Uh, it was at uh, Gerwood Park, that's another camp, another tour. I was doing a thing to get a handover and to, to do a tour, a part of a tour with the light infantry from my regiment and then stay on with the light infantry. And I was over there with Delta Company. I was A Company. And then I moved over with Delta Company, do a rear party, and then stay with the light infantry. Now, uh, something happened, an incident that upset the local population. And I swear, I mean, I, I didn't see, you know, you don't see where they come from. Mm -hmm. It was like, mm -hmm. one, next thing, something happened, we turned our corner, next thing it was like 4,000 angry pro-IRA families and IRA members around us pushed up against the wall. We were, we were just a four-man brick, and there was thousands of them. Jeez. And I, all I had in my head was the image the video they showed us in pre-Ireland training of what happened to those boys. Yeah. Oh, it was strong imagery. I risked my neck that day. Yeah, I, I stood up. They don't come in. I, I, risked, I risked my neck that day and put myself... Yeah, I, I'm a short guy. I'm five foot six. Now, the crowd was all right in front of us. One guy was throwing his paddy basher around. That's what we call the thing for the plastic bullets. We call it a party basher. Uh -huh. Right. For the gun for the plastic bullets. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, the brick commander, he was on the radio and the offending asshole was uh, shouting and screaming and all acting scared. And everything went slow motion for me and I was like, like this, and behind me there was a telephone junction box. Everybody was so close to me, and being a small guy, I couldn't see past the front row of people. And I was like, okay, I was like, fuck it. So I got up on top of that telephone junction box. I could see the balaclavas coming in. I could see them all in the black heads coming in. So I made a big show of cocking my weapon, and then I made a big show of putting it, the safety off. And a big show, like, and pointing at one guy who I knew as a player, as a face, and I pointed my gut right at him. And I was like, I pointed to myself, like, me, yeah, but you first. Uh, and the, and I could, like, the balaclavas were coming in from all around us, like, in every direction. We were just about to get hit. And then uh, the RUC came in from the right, and an army Land Rover came in from the left, and they all dispersed, but we were that fucking far. Holy that shit. Far from getting it. Yeah. Like, and I just thought I was going to be a naked body on there. Yeah. Dude, that's fucking That was the one insane, time man. I see my boys lose. Pardon? I'm just saying that that's insane. Like, that's a crazy fucking story right there that you just told us. <laughs> like, that's some shit that makes you, like, not sleep well for a little while afterwards, I'm sure. I was too dumb to care at the time. <laughs> too young. Yeah, you were young. Yeah. 
too young, yeah. It wasn't until the next time I went anywhere until I was, when that dog died. It's the only thing that I have, I got many hits in the head when I was a youngster, uh -huh. and I have, like, I don't have an emotional width. Uh -huh. You know, there's not that many emotions there, yeah? yeah. Uh, yet, I have strong emotions for animals. I'm a hunter, but I can't abide them suffering. I can't abide it. Yeah. And our sniffer dog getting his legs blown off and his jaw, bottom of his jaw, taken off, and that noise it made... Uh, one of the guys put that dog out of his misery and they charged him £90 for a negligent, negligent discharge. What the fuck, man? Respect but think if you're out there, respect for that what you did. Uh, yeah, they charged him 90 quid for a, a negligent discharge. Jeez. There was no negligence at all. He put that dog out of his misery. Yeah. Yeah. We got the guy... Yeah, our brick commander, Stevie, he got the guy. The guy said his legs like a giraffe or brick commander, you know, big lanky fella. He ran up that road and trundled him down. Seen him throw the gloves down and he took him down and that's it, yeah. I think he's, he's, he's out of prison now. Well, he got the guy he got that out of prison. There. Yeah, the bomber. He got let out of prison on the agreement and that. So when that agreement happened, that peace agreement, did all of the IRA soldiers just go free? Not all of them. Many of them, yeah. Many, many, many of them, yeah. Ones that, I think ones that had, like, killed civilians and, you, you, know, you know, like, some of the big, the big bombers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the ones that have killed lots of people and that, and their bombs and that, they, they, yeah, they, they keep kept the bombers in, I think. But a lot of the soldiers, just general IRA soldiers, they let out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So same, it, same with the other side as well, the Protestants. They would have, they would have let their Protestant prisoners. The IRA would have let the Protestant prisoners go as well. No, no, the British had Protestant prisoners as well. Oh. But I thought the Protestants were on the British side. But they were still breaking the law. Murder and mayhem is still against the law in this country. Uh, it's right. a matter of religion. Right. If you're loyal to the Queen or not, you can't go around doing murder and mayhem. So it's weird, though, because like the IRA was so pissed at England. Right. But really, like who they should have been more upset with was the Protestant Irish. Who are loyalists, call themselves right, right. loyalists, unionists, monarchists, British. Right. They are British. There's no taking that away from them. That's why it's such a contentious issue. They're Irish, but they're also British. Like you can be English and you can be British, Scottish, British, Welsh, British. Northern Irish, British. It's like the States. You're, you know, you're kind of one thing, but se separate, yeah. but one thing. Yeah, if you're an American, you're an American. If you're a Brit, you're a Brit. doesn't matter what part of Britain you're from. Yeah, and, and now, oh, that's another thing I have a problem with, the Scottish National Party. Now that we have Brexit, the Scottish National Party wants to split the Union apart. I don't want another. Look, I'm not British, I, I, whatever, but like, why would Scotland want to leave? I mean, I get it. Like, William Wallace, freedom, this but is, like, I don't get it. Disillusionment yeah. and all that freedom stuff, that's bullshit. <laughs> who do you think, who do you actually think gained most from the British Empire? Scotland. Who put the union together in Parliament? Scotland. Who was the first king of Britain? A Scottish king. And then once they killed him, his nephew, whatever, right? Uh, that, then, like, that was the Stuarts going on. And that takes us that takes us back to Ireland again. The Stuarts, King William of Orange, against the Catholics over in the Battle of the Boyne. And that, get, that gets us right back there again. It's, 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 it's come, everything's got a circle with that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's crazy how everything comes for full circle when you're talking about this history stuff. Like, what happened back then 
is always bound to repeat itself in some manner of speaking. Yeah, yeah. Well, has it, has it all been in for vain now? With, I mean, I, I, even now I see that the point of the, 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 the loyalists, I see their point now, whereas I never did before in my life. The, the, the threat of me losing my British citizenship of Britain, I'm from the Orkney Islands, which, by the way, we're not Scots. We're damn Norn. We're Scandinavians. We're kind of Vikings. We may have a Scottish passport, but our blood is Pictish and Scandinavian. We're not Celtic, who's their European types, Celts. They're from Europe with uh, Southern Europe and Eastern Europe and that. And then we're from Northern Europe and we're a different kind of peoples and that. And now that they want, uh, if Scotland wants to come away from uh, the Union of Britain, my personal stance is I would like to go back to the Orkney Islands and take Orkney to have independence from Scotland. <laughs> we have the gas, we have the oil, we've got the gold, we've got silver, we've got uranium. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got everything we need, yeah? We've got all electricity. We sell electricity. We're an energy producer. Uh, we don't need Scotland. So uh, if Scotland thinks they don't need the union, they're crazy. Mm -hmm. They're crazy. They're a, they're a little fish in a big pond. They're mental. There's companies out there that have more clout than Scotland. Like Jeff Bezos has more clout, clout than Scotland. How do you think is Scotland going to do? Do you know what I mean? No, I, I'm in full agreement. Like, you know, obviously being an American and outsider, but like, what, it, what is Scotland's GDP? Like, it, Scotland doesn't really do much. It doesn't sell much. You know what I mean? It doesn't export much, does it? Besides like what? Gingerbread or <laughs> whiskey? Shortbread. Yeah. Shortbread, shortbread and haggis. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I had a good haggis hunt at the new year, by the way. Oh, haggis? Yeah. I've never had haggis, man. I don't haggis know hunting. Haggis hunting. Oh, haggis hunting. It's a new year tradition. Yeah, we go new it. year's tradition. Uh, you see, the haggises, their right legs and the females are longer than the left legs. And the males, it's the opposite. Huh. And what we do is we, we take a, a net from the top of the hill and we put the net to the bottom of the hill and we chase the haggis around so they turn around the other way and roll to the bottom of the hill. That's how we catch haggis. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not true. Okay. That's what we tell the English. Yes. <laughs> I've, I've, actually, I've actually had... Like a friend of mine from, he'll be watching this actually, right? Hello, Alan. He's in North Carolina. He's in uh, Charlotte, right now, Charlotte, yeah, North Carolina. I had him believing, uh, he lived here in London with me a long time, that haggises were animals. He really yeah. believed that. <laughs> They're a sheep stomach and full of nonsense, yeah. Uh, and I, I just couldn't believe that he did that. And ever since, sometimes when I talk to American, I just kind of help myself. Because I always remember that. I love my Alan. He's, he's, a, he's a brother. He's a good man. Yeah, he really is. Yeah. What's up, Alan? I can't, I can't blame that you're um, trying to do that to Americans because we're going to have a lot of Americans now thinking like there's haggises with freaking like one leg shorter than the other running around Scotland. Well, you, everybody believes all that nonsense about the Loch Ness monster and the yeah, tourists yeah, yeah. keep on coming <laughs> with, the, with the dollars. Yeah. Well, that's that's exactly why you freaking have them keep believing it, man, to keep them coming back. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. we have another one as well that was from the old days. That they used to put water in a bottle and sell it to the English and say it was Scotch mist. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've not had that one for a while. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the Loch Ness monster, the haggis hunting, these are just like I think these all come from like Halloween, you know, mm, tricks, yeah. devilment night, and yeah, yeah. that's how you got Halloween in the States, isn't it? From our thing in Scotland, is that right? Yeah, huh. Halloween's from Scotland. I never knew that. Where I come from in Orkney, it's called devilment night. 
Ah, and the fast. children, the children, it's, it's a bit more tame now from when I was a kid. The children are encouraged to go out and make devilment. Huh. That means mayhem and vandalism. Mm -hmm. Like, you don't know. It's not like it used to be. We used to be terrible. Back, back, back in the, like the early 80s and that, late 70s, I mean, the police, they didn't know what to do. They were just left. And I, and I did do some naughty things in Devilment <laughs> Night when I was a youth. Yeah. So, so in America, night. we've got Mischief Night, which is the night before Halloween. And that's like Devilment Night, what you guys have. That's it. Yeah. That's what but we you know, have. Yeah. Nowadays, nothing ever happens on Mischief Night. I think the kids are too busy playing video games at home. But when I was growing up, this was in the 90s, it was, you know, same type of thing. Throw the toilet paper at someone's house or break a window, throw some eggs or something. But yeah, nowadays, yeah. Man, kids are all just so soft. They don't, they don't even want to leave their house. Yeah, I mean, we would, we would be out with the petrol cans and stuff, you know, when we were young. <laughs> <laughs> we were that bad. Crazy though, man. Like I've known a bunch of you guys. Um, and when I was doing this stuff in uh, the UK, there was a number of Scottish guys there. And they were fucking hardcore, dude. <laughs> like, I can't, like they're all warriors, man. I don't know what it is about Scottish people. Well, we come from a martial country. Yeah. You know, we have a martial class, an officer class, the whole of the UK. Yeah. Uh, the Scots, it comes from... Now, we have a reputation for being great people and very welcoming and loving and all these things. But we treat each other like shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I've noticed that it's a way of, it's almost like a, a thing of endearment, though, what you guys do. Like, you break each other's balls um, or you take oh, yeah. a kiss, right? Like, yeah. 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 Yeah, we do that. Yeah. And I suppose I'm uh, quite a, an offender on that myself. I do oh, like yeah. Things. Usually the the military guys are the worst, and you guys are yes. crazy. And you know, it wasn't until you guys started taking the piss from me that I really felt like I was welcomed in your in your yeah. country. Yeah. yeah, it's when you get ignored and people are cold to you. That's when you know you're not on a right footing. But yeah. If you're getting rubbed, you know there's love there. Yeah. It's yeah. Super. yeah. It's yeah. funny the way the cultures work, man. I mean, the U.S. military is kind of the same way, but it's it's different in the British in the British thing, man. You guys yeah, we, get after each other. I've I've noticed that we're somewhere in the middle between the Russian system and the American system. Yeah, the Russians have got that granddad system that's fucking hardcore, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and you guys have got your drill parade sergeant guy that's fucking hardcore, right? We have it in the middle that, yeah, we're savage to each other. Yeah. In there. And, and it's a culture of savagery. Yeah. I, I, and it did change. And I can give you a very good example. A very, very good example. And this takes us back to Ireland again. Before I was around the 90s, early 90s, training changed in the British Army. They had to do for the young, like like me, the junior leaders who joined when they're very young. We were doing all our training in boots, and all these young boys were coming out with serious Achilles tendonitis and things like this yeah. once they were older. I'm one of them. Yeah, I've got really bad Achilles tendonitis from doing all that training in my boots. Now then, there was guys coming to the regiment that hadn't done any real running in boots, so they weren't like to us. They were soft. Yeah, <laughs> and we had to be, you know, it's a savage culture. I was beat on. Everybody gets beat on at some point or other, yeah? Now, just before we were, go, I was to go out to Ireland, weeks before I was to go out to Ireland, a senior private turned around and says to me that I have to tell another private to get the shit together because he joined at the same time as me. Now, I went over to this guy and I poked him in the chest. I didn't even poke him in the chest. I pointed at his chest. And I says, look, you get your shit together, clean this, clean that. I just come off guard, a long guard. It was a bad one. Uh, I says, I don't need this. I'm getting shit from on high, and I don't want to shit on you. Next thing you know, 
I'm getting changed into my gear. I'm getting marched to the jail, into the guardhouse. For that, what I did there, that, or oh, this was, sorry, the next day I got marched to the guardhouse, which I thought was a joke at the beginning because the provost corporal once caught me in bed with a woman in the camp and marched me to the guardhouse as a joke in front of my woman to make me embarrassed, right? Now, I thought he was doing the same again. Uh, and I'm like, ah, fuck off, Davey. And he's like, no, you're going to jail. What are you talking about? I'm going to go to jail. He says, you're going to jail. Hot two, double march. Da, da, lift, da, 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 da. Off I went. Uh, as soon as I get in there, uh, they tell me I'm in there for bullying. Bullying. Now, this guy that I pointed at, Phones his mother. Mom, I'm getting bullied and blah, 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 blah. He was too scared to go to Ireland. Right? So he says, I was bullying him. The regiment, they got to the bottom of everything. Found out that I never bullied him, didn't do anything. But because the guy's parents telephoned the regiment, they had to be seen to be doing something. They gave me eight days in prison. Took eight days' wages off me, fucked me around for eight days in the jail in the army guard room. You know how it is, it's heavy, yeah. Uh, and they admitted to me they knew I was innocent. Jeez. I refused my CO's uh, orders. I said, no, I'm taking it to the, no, my, I refused my OC, the major uh, company commander. I refused his thing. And then I went to the, the regiment, the boss, the CEO, commanding officer, and then I was refusing his judgment as well. And they says to me, uh, you know, if you refuse his judgment, you get remanded, you, you have to stay here for a court martial and you cannot go to Ireland with a regiment. Hmm. I was like, what? And, and they knew I was innocent. They admitted this to me, yeah. They says, look, I just take the time, take the jail, and then you'll be out of jail and then you'll go to Ireland. That's it, yeah? Hmm. And that happened. And they did that just to be shown that they were doing something for a coward, a coward. Yeah. That's that was the beginning up. of me. I, I, I started to dislike the army at that point. Yeah. Well, you made a good point earlier when you said, you know, everyone's kind of fired up at first. And then when shit starts sucking, you know, all of that embrace the suck. Like you can say all that shit all you want, but uh, it doesn't help any. <laughs> When it's cold and you're freaking sleep deprived and like you're doing shit that you don't like, like it sucks. It really sucks. Oh, ah, my bloody computer wasn't plugged in. My screen was going dark there. Oh, I'm glad you caught that. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, my battery running out of my laptop. Oh, oh, they go quick when you don't have it plugged in. Yeah, yeah. So That's I want to... Yeah. Um, Get back real quick, and we're gonna have to do. We're gonna have to have you back on the podcast, man, because I try not to let them go too long. Otherwise, guys get distracted and they don't watch. Mm -hmm. But uh, I feel like we haven't even scratched the surface yet. But let me bring it back real quick. You're sitting over in Ireland, um, and again, I want to stress to people that, like, I think you and I went back and forth about some other things that you have done. But just out of um, professional courtesy, I'm gonna leave it to Northern Ireland for this chat. Um, you're sitting over in Northern Ireland. You've got your freaking nine millimeter under your thigh. You know, you're, you're doing this really cool guy shit, frankly speaking. Um, That's, that was only for three weeks. Okay. Yeah. And so what I, short I, would assume, period. I would assume they put you on, I would assume they put you on the surveillance cycle and take you off fairly quick, you know, so that you don't heat up too much. Right. They, they, they took me off quicker than most because it was too young. Uh, and they, and I was, they no, I was too immature. Yeah. Too immature. Yeah. They thought it might have been all right, but no. Because I, I came there after, after the regiment. I was a face that nobody knew. I hadn't pounded the streets. Yeah. yeah. It was a mistake on their part. Yeah. I got taken off it pretty quickly. But then they put me on reds. That is when you all you do is go around with the RUC and do heavier rests. Uh, now, that's exciting. So you're kicking in yeah. at that point. Taking names. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Man. So, okay. So you're kicking indoors. You're dragging away top ranking, middle ranking, IRA, um, you know, individuals, freaking, you know, clandestine spies and shit like that. Um, you're taking them in, you're taking them out. 
What was that? I mean, what was that like, man? I mean, you, you've clearly got a respect for the well, enemy, but, you know, you were doing would, the job. We would roll up. The RUC would have the Land Rovers, us uh, supporting them and escorting them. The, we'd be in front of them, behind them, and our Army Land Rovers, we would roll up to wherever we had to go. In the briefing, we obviously would have a briefing before in the police station, and they say, we're going out to get this person, we're going to this place, and this is how it's going down today. If the police felt it was going to be... It, was, that it wasn't going to go peaceful, they would send us in, yeah? Mm. If it's peaceful, they would knock on the door, and if everything was police, all went fine, we had nothing to do. But when the shit kicked off, that was why they needed us for Reds. Now, I would imagine very, sometimes these um, IRA dudes would not want to go peaceful. I mean, were there ever times where they grabbed their AK and started shooting at you, or...? Not like that, no. And uh, somebody once with a handgun in a house with a couple of bullets came down the stairs. I was not in the line of fire. I, the stairs were going up to the left. I was going to the right into the living room. And a couple of guy, one guy was going up, a guy Shiner, and some shots came down there like that, that one time, yeah. But... Uh, the guy, I remember the one thing about that guy, he came out and steel toe cap boots naked, apart from big steel toe cap <laughs> boots, handcuffed up. I remember that one, yeah. That's funny. Yeah, it, you, know, you know what it reminds me of a lot is um, Israel. Israel and the Palestinians. It really reminds me of that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's exactly like that. I mean, it's got the religious part. It's got the sovereignty part. And the, the racism and the pig-headed prejudice. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Got all of that. Yeah. Hilarious. Well, there's a reason I think the IRA and the um, Palestinians were, were friends, you know? I think yeah. they got a lot of weapons uh, over to Ireland. And that bastard Gaddafi gave them yeah. a lot of hell, yeah? Yeah, that's true. The Libyans too, right? Yeah. And the training too, I think. So, so did you guys. Uh, yeah, we did. I, you know, guilty as charged. The Americans definitely helped the IRA quite a bit. Yeah. The Fenians. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you we were, were like we were a lot of us. Next, from it. Apart from the Gaddafi years, you were the next largest contributors. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of, you know, even top ranking American like businessmen um, and even politicians. Polit yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Congressmen. Congressmen. Governors. Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, their their freaking grandfathers and fathers just come over from Ireland, you know, the generation before. So what were they supposed to do, right? Like, I mean, they they, they come over with better hearts from even the potato famine to yeah. the nineteen sixties. A lot, a lot of when when sixties and seventies when things started getting bad again, mm -hmm. a whole new another generation of I, Irish people in the states, yeah. Well, even like look at the Civil War, American Civil War, the first one where you had um, the Irish regiments, the Irish brigades. These guys were coming over specifically to get trained and learn how to fight and fight. And then their intentions were to go back over to Ireland, use that training. Yeah. I, I knew about a lot of Irish guys getting dragged off the boats to fight for the Union. But it makes sense that they would go over there for the training and the contacts. It's crazy. For yeah. the enemies of, because they were still the enemies of Britain at that time. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't long before that my sister regiment burnt the White House down, the Black Watch. <laughs> oh, shit. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That wasn't the White House. It was just somewhere we were using, you know. <laughs> was it? Is that what it was? It actually, it we, was we have it on, like, on our walls and all that. We actually have it written down that it was the White House that we burned <laughs> down. <laughs> That's what it says. History, but I know that um, when the British Marines came over, they destroyed like everything except our Marine Corps Regiment house, be, just out of respect. Okay, yeah. That's, that's pretty cool, yeah. I, I, I like that kind of thing between soldiers and that and... The like you you see a lot of that in the air force in the Second World War. Mm. Fighter pilots had so much respect for each other. 
Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. They would even help each other. You know? It's, yeah. And I've seen uh, old World War II films of like interrogation training and stuff where you would be, inter- they would be interrogating each other, but they would never, they would always be very civil with each other. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's building up that confidence now. It set, sets off these little inhibitors in your brain and they fire off little neurons and that and gets you talking and makes you feel relaxed. And, yeah. 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 I remember them. Oh, they, they teach us all that before Ireland, you know? Yeah. That's one thing I want to ask you about uh, before we close out is the pre-deployment training that you guys went through for Ireland. Can you can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, it's good fun. Yeah, uh, it's a place called Senalaga where I did mine. Yeah, they call it Ten City. I, I was my I was I was I had a, a an operational tour, an operational posting in Germany. That's where my regiment was. Yeah. And from there, they took us to Tin City in Senelaga. And that is like a, a fake city, yeah, where you learn Fibua, fighting in both up areas, and your uh, CQB, mm. uh, all of that. That's what's all that for. You do your riot training, you do your uh, intelligence training and all that. You sit in dark rooms looking at uh, bloody projection screens all day long. Terrorists' faces, terrorist number plates, addresses, maps. You have to know the area, like the back of your hand, before you set foot on ground. You have to know it exactly. And they'll test you on that before you go. And if you don't know where one street is relative to another in your mind, you're you're not good enough. Yeah, I mean, now they've got GPS. They didn't then. <laughs> so, and then, and, and the riot training is really good. I love that. Just... They get a whole lot of soldiers to come and throw petrol bombs and stones at the people who are coming. And soldiers tend to be good at what they do, so they coordinate their rioting better than any mob would, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, got, I remember I got the job as the fireman, and, and you've got all the, the shields out, you've got the snatch team as well behind the shields, and you've got the vehicles, two vehicles like that. And you have to, I had to hide like that behind the open doors at the back of the vehicle and the side of the vehicle. I had like that much to hide my body because I had to jump and put all the fires out <laughs> with a fire extinguisher, right? And every time I went out there to put a fire out, the sky went black, right? And like, you know, about three ton of coal would land on top of me and I'd be on the floor. <laughs> boom, 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 all over my body armor and, oh, wow. and start breaking your your visor and that would start coming off. And oh, the fireman, it's just the worst job ever. Of course, <laughs> they're giving me that job because I was the youngest. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't pay to be the youngest in those situations sometimes. No, it does not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty hardcore training, uh, but it's tedious as well, you know, the, the, the time in the classroom. Yeah. A lot of people falling asleep and yeah, yeah, especially when all the life fired fire. and yeah, yeah. I, I, the Kell House is where we all like to be, isn't it? Yeah, that's the cool guy stuff. That's what everyone signs up for. Yes, yeah, yeah. I, and uh, my God, is it difficult? It's not as easy as you think. No, I, I, I've been a marksman since I was twelve years old. I joined the Lovett Scouts. That's the, the army cadets, which they were a sniper regiment in the First World War and blah, blah, blah. But they stayed on as a territorial army. And under the TA banner, I was an army cadet when I was a youth. And I became a marksman at 12. Right. So I've been shooting forever. Yeah. And I, you know, I could shoot a, a hare on the run at 100 meters when I was, you know, a young kid and all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. When I got out to Tin City... And I started having to learn to shoot from a moving vehicle yeah. at close-up targets. That's that, I find that quite hard to get myself adjusted to. With a handgun, okay, but with a rifle, took me a little while to get to that, yeah? And you don't get many passes when you're doing that because they've got to put a lot of people through that training, yeah? Yeah, and I personally feel that I didn't get enough passes on that to be proficient enough yeah. to get, cause I, w- I was missing targets. 
You know, I was like sometimes not even taking the shot because I was missing. But that's I yeah, mean uh, it, is that they have to get guys through, and you know, it's you could you get the instruction, and then if you don't grasp it, you know, you move on. Yeah, yeah, you've you've got to get it in the end. You know, I mean, yeah. we do a lot of top cover in Ireland, a lot of top cover. Yeah, I mean, is uh, up the top of the Land Rovers, just standing up, oh, two two okay. heads out the top, and you drive around the city and that. So we did do an awful lot of that. Yeah, that and pounding the roads and and, and that top cover stuff is tedious as hell. Yeah, huh. uh, uh, I'd rather pound you're the roads. Watching so much. Yeah, yeah, and, and in fact, my best friend from the um, from the regiment uh, is in a different company. Right at I height, he well, he's seen what they call you know the D10 command wire. He's seen it like a telephone wire, but yeah. it was two wires, and he followed it straight down and right at I height on the top of the Land Rover thing. It was the C4 was dug into a telegraph pole that the telephone line was on, yeah? And he grabbed his mate, pulled him down. He's like, down. They got blasted. They got thrown over the side. The vehicle kind of shunted to the side. It was doing fine until it hit a kind of traffic island. And then, boom, it just went over and they spilled right out the top. Yeah, he was very lucky. He was so lucky, yeah. Damn. Hello, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> dude, that's insane, man. Like, those IRAs, though, they were freaking, they were savage, man. They didn't care. They would just, they would kill you if they could. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, guys are all, soldiers. I mean, all of you guys who went over there are all lucky to have come home. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I was on the tail end of the violence. I suppose I would be... Those last couple of years, you know, like of the violence, we got, yeah, my regiment got the last two years of the violence over there. Then it calmed down for a while. And th those guys are, they're truly, truly committed. Yeah. And they're full on. They can't, they're, they were good at what they do, really good at what they do. And they've been at it for a long time. They so are very good. They're very committed. They were very good. They were very committed. And, um, I mean, it really shows you that when an oppressor force occupies a region, um, they're going to have a fucking hard time if the people don't want them there. Too well. I mean, you know yourself, all it takes one dedicated man to get a job done. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and if you and if you that hundreds, of hundreds with, you know, the, the oppressor force doing fucked up things, it makes it easier and easier. So... You know, I think yeah. sometimes all yeah. it really takes is time and patience and the uh, the oppressor force will make more soldiers. They will do it. Yeah. Yeah. They'll churn them out at whatever cost. Yeah. They will make up a draft. They'll conscript people. Whatever the cost is. Yeah. Because they, they don't care. No. We can't afford it for them. Yeah. Hey, it's all it's all a pol like political thing at the end of the day for both sides, you know, for the IRA and for Britain. Yeah. Is you and yeah. I mean, I, I, want to, I want to definitely, definitely get you back on the podcast, man. Um, I'm gonna close it out right now reluctantly because I feel like there's just so much to talk about. But, um, bro, this is yeah. a fascinating conversation for me. So, thanks for coming on. I, I appreciate you giving us your time. Thank you for having me on. It's been good, yeah. Pleasure. Been a good, Pleasure. It's been a bit cathartic. I've not talked about this stuff ever, really, ever. I mean, I, I talk. I, my friends know I was a soldier, but I don't talk details. And uh, I like this. I like this, yes. This is something new for me. It's good. It's good to talk about it. And it, I can tell when I'm listening to you, man, that like you were, you were there and like you saw some shit like you. Yeah. So I can always tell with people, man, it's, it's been cool to, to listen to your stuff. So I'm going to get in touch with you, man, an email and we'll go back and forth and we'll get you back on as soon as possible. Cause I want to do part two. Of it.